Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm going to be doing an RGB mod on this little Sony Trinitron television. So without further ado, let's get right to it. What you see here on the bench are two very typical 90s Sony Trinitron televisions. This dark color scheme of these sets, sort of a slate color, it's actually more like a dark gray than a black, was very common on all of Sony's TVs back then. They moved to this from the wood grain look of the 80s and the 70s, and they continued this all the way through, I think into the early 2000s, when they then switched to that silver color scheme with the flat CRT. So it was right near the end of the entire CRT era. And even though these sets were pretty common back in the day, they are not super easy to find at this point. I think most people have just thrown away all of the sets that were of the smaller sizes at least. And the ones that are left are somewhat valuable these days because, you know, everyone is crazy for CRTs. They want to do their retro gaming or whatever. And that has caused the prices to jump way up. This set on the right, it's a 9-inch Trinitron, and it is model number KV9PT60. And it dates from 1996. Now, those of you who watch my second channel may notice that this set looks familiar because I recently took apart a white version of this set that unfortunately had been dropped and the CRT was catastrophically damaged, as was the entire case. After I put that video out, a local viewer reached out and said that they had the black version of the set, which is this one right here, and they said they would love to give it to me. So, of course, I gladly accepted because I think this form factor is just wonderful. What's especially cool about this set, besides the fact that it is a Trinitron, is that it has a very convenient carry handle on the top, and it's very easy to pick up and move around. If you're shopping for one of these sets, the PT60, which is the black version here, has one little extra feature in that it is a dual input voltage, meaning it has 120 volts AC with a removable power cord on the back, and it has a 12 volt DC input. It seems that Sony targeted this to be used inside vehicles, hence the 12 volt input, because they also sold a plate on the bottom that allowed you to actually clip the TV on so it wouldn't go flying while you drove down the road. Otherwise, it's pretty much identical to the PT50, which I think was targeted to be used inside kitchens and bedrooms and things like that. It has a fixed power cord and no DC input. The larger set is a KV13TR28, so it's a 13 inch Trinitron. It's basically the same as this 9 inch version here with a from a capability standpoint, except it has a front AV input and a back AV input, while the smaller set here only has a rear input. And of course, both of these have analog RF input. When it comes to other features, these two sets are actually pretty much identical. They're both just NTSC sets, they don't decode PAL color. They don't have RGB inputs, they don't have S-Video inputs, they don't have stereo sound. They're kind of low end actually when it comes to Sony sets. Although here in North America at least, all of the smaller sets they sold were relatively devoid of features and they left the extra features to their larger sets. Things like picture-in-picture, S-Video, component inputs, stuff like that. Now the subject of this video of course is going to be adding RGB to this set on the right. But the reason why I have the 13 inch on the bench is that I have found that most sets from the 90s on Sony's are all pretty much the same on the inside. I mean they're not identical, but they use a very similar architecture. And the way you typically add RGB onto a set like this is you need to be able to inject the RGB signals into the main video processor chip, also known as the Jungle IC. And it seems that Sony used that same IC on a lot of these sets. So anything we talk about with RGB modding on this small 9-inch set should probably apply to any of the other sets like the 13-inch, the 19-inch, and probably even the larger ones as well. So if you're one of my viewers who lives in Europe and you're wondering why I'm talking about adding RGB input to a CRT when RGB inputs should already be there in the form of a SCART jack, well, unfortunately, there were never any mandates in North America or Japan that said what type of inputs should be on a set. Therefore, the inputs that are on these sets is only basically what is demanded by the market. And on small sets like this, composite video is optional and RF is pretty much the only thing you would ever find for sure on these small ones. And then mid-range sets might have things like S-Video and later high-end sets would have things like component video input. But again, that was completely driven by market forces and no mandates. So therefore, 
pretty much no TV sets ever came with RGB in North America. Now, regular viewers to my channel know that I'm a huge fan of CRTs, especially in conjunction with an old retro computer or old video sources like VCRs and stuff like that. Those things were designed to be used with CRTs. They are completely analog in nature, and they just don't look as good on a high resolution display that we have today, like the one back there. This is my trusty Commodore 1084 monitor. This one's made by Philips, and it's one of the most versatile 15 kilohertz displays around, at least in my opinion. It's a 13 inch CRT, and it's actually physically not that big, which is kind of nice. It has a built-in speaker for audio amplification, and it's a pretty reliable monitor, although these can break because the flybacks seem to go bad on these a lot, although I haven't had that problem, at least with, with this one. If I need to use a 13 inch CRT with RGB, I'm going to get this set out. And it's the reason why that 13 inch Sony TV I have is not RGB modded because it would sort of be superfluous because I already have a 13 inch monitor that has RGB. But what I don't have is a small monitor that has RGB. And that's where this nine inch set comes in. This set, while it's not that big of a difference in size. I mean, they, you know, similar size. It is so much lighter to pick up and move around, not to mention it has a handle on the top, than even the Commodore 1084. Lately, I've been finding that when a CRT is too big and bulky and heavy, I don't really use it that much because it's such a pain. And the smaller the set is, like this one, but even something like this, the more likely I'll want to have it handy because it doesn't take up a lot of space on the shelf, but then it's so easy to grab and use. Before we get started, let's talk a little bit about safety and CRTs. I am very experienced working on CRTs, but if you are not, you should not be opening the cover of a CRT, period. The mains voltages that are in there, especially if it's plugged into the wall, are absolutely lethal and can be very dangerous. Not to mention the shock you can get from the high voltage of the CRT if it's running, and even when it's powered off, there are capacitors and the CRT itself can retain a charge and you can get a nasty shock. So again, do not remove the cover of a CRT unless you absolutely know what you're doing and how to be safe about it. Okay, so what you see on the bench here are the actual guts, the, all the electronics that are inside that little set. Right now, all that's left in there is the flexion yoke and the CRT. The main board here does everything. It's got the power supply, it's got the tuner, it's got the microcontroller, it's got the video processing, it's got the horizontal and vertical deflection, and of course it has the flyback transformer here, which generates the high voltage that runs the CRT. This particular set also has a DC to DC converter because it has that 12 volt supply. There's another small PCB here. This is what plugs into the back of the CRT itself. And this takes RGB signals that are processed by this IC over here and convert it to the levels that are needed to actually drive the CRT. It's pretty amazing when you look at this board. I think this one's from, what, 1996. If you looked at a TV from like 1985, it would be far more complicated than this. And that's because in those years between the 80s and well, the 70s, 80s, and then into the 90s, they really figured out how to condense large amounts of circuitry down to single chips, like this 48 pin one right here. Now, while we're gonna be looking at Sony TVs, and like I said, I think that this should apply to all those 90s Sony TVs, other brands of TVs are going to work in a similar fashion to this, but the chips aren't gonna be the same, the locations aren't gonna be the same, so you're gonna have to do a lot of research and looking at data sheets and whatnot if you're trying to add RGB to anything other than a Sony TV. I wanted to add one more point about this type of mod. When you do this mod, you need to be doing it on a set that has a fully isolated power supply or at least a partially isolated supply where all the video processing circuitry is fully isolated. Older sets from the 80s and earlier here in North America often have a hot chassis, which means the power supply inside is not isolated from the mains power coming in from the wall, which means adding an RGB input or even a composite input to those sets is not safe. Now, when it comes to adding RGB to a set like this that doesn't already have RGB, we're gonna rely on the fact that typically the video processing IC, which is this IC on this set, still has an RGB input even though it's unused. Sometimes that RGB input is used specifically for on-screen displays, but in the case of the Sony's, when we'll look at this in a second, it actually has uh, two RGB inputs, one for the on-screen displays and another one that would have been used with an analog RGB input, like SCART, if there were actually a thing on this set. So to aid in coming up with this mod, let's dig into the service manual for this set and also the data sheet for the video processing or jungle IC. Luckily for this particular TV, I have both the service manual for it, the BN1 chassis, 
and I have the data sheet for the video processor IC, which gives us more information about the way the IC works than the schematics are necessarily going to give us. If you are trying to RGB mod a set other than a Sony, your mileage may vary on finding a service manual for it, but hopefully you can Google all the part numbers of the various ICs on the board and at least figure out which one is the jungle IC or the video processor IC to see if it has those elusive unused RGB inputs. Down on page 33 of this schematic, it has a block diagram for the set. And let's just take a quick look at it to kind of see the topology of how this thing works. Here we have the microcontroller. It's labeled IC101. And this is what does all the on-screen displays and all the control of the entire TV. Right here, we have the outputs for the on-screen displays. And you can see OR, OG, and OB, that's the RGB output. And we also have OSD blank. What the blanking signal does is when the microcontroller asserts this line, it tells the video processor IC to switch just ever so briefly over to the on-screen displays. So the way it overlays the text, this RGB data on top of the video signal, is anytime the microcontroller is trying to write a character or graphics or whatever it's doing, it also asserts that blanking line at the exact right moment that the RGB lines are also outputting data. And that allows that text to hover perfectly on top of the video signal, but not blank the entire screen. On the next page, we have IC301, which is the video processor or the jungle IC as it's typically known. And right there, you see the RGB in, and there's also this OSD pin here on nine. And this is the blanking pin that we saw on the microcontroller. And on Sony TVs, what this jungle IC does is it takes the YC input, yes, which is the Luma Chroma or S video basically, to an RGB signal, which if we scroll over, makes its way over, well, it goes to the next page. It goes over to the neck PCB that is connected to the back of the CRT. And that is actually what is driving the entire set. The video processor I see right down here is connected to the microcontroller through an I squared C link so that the microcontroller has full control of video processor IC at all time. So when you're adjusting any of those video settings like tint or contrast or, or color, things like that, those commands are all coming over the serial bus here. And then the video processor IC is taking that video input signal and then it's converting it to RGB to go to the neck board. The video processor is also handling the horizontal and vertical drive. So there's output here on pin 37, that is the H drive, and there is the vertical drive. So it's really doing a lot. And that's what I said before, it replaced a whole bunch of discrete circuitry in the old days with just this one IC. Now, very typical for Sony TVs when it comes to switching between different video inputs, including like the tuner or the external inputs or on a more high-end TV, the multiple video inputs, that is facilitated by a separate IC, which on this is IC401, just called a, a switch. And this is under the control of the microcontroller as well. So when you hit that TV video button on the remote, that's the microcontroller then telling the switch IC to switch between two different inputs. And on this particular set, since it's a very simple set, it has a video in, audio in, and that goes into the switch IC. And the other inputs on pin one and pin three are coming from the tuner. So that's where the sound and the video from the tuner come from. Anyways, the switch just switches between those two. And the outputs, they just go directly into the YC inputs here on the video processor, which gets turned to RGB, as I said. There's one other little piece of detail I want to mention is that the video signal, when it comes off here and it goes into the YC input, it also makes its way through this buffer over here, also to a sync separator, and then into the horizontal and vertical sync inputs on the video processor IC. Whenever you're hooking up something to a television set, you need to have the sync information along with the video signal for it to display anything. And very typically on an RGB signal, you're going to have the RGB, the red, green, blue, and then you're going to have a separate sync line that has that sync information. And we need to feed that into this television. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to display a correct picture because it won't be able to synchronize to it. We're going to take advantage of the fact that this set just takes the regular composite video with the composite sync information in it and feeds that pretty much directly in the video processor for us to get that RGB input into this thing with the correct sync information. Okay, we figured out for sure that this IC here has an RGB input because we see it on the block diagram. I've done some RGB mods on some other sets and it turns out that the only RGB input that there is on the video processor is the one that's also in use by the on-screen displays. So if you're gonna do an RGB mod on those, you have to A, figure out if that signal that's going into the jungle IC is analog, like a normal analog RGB signal. And if it is, then you can cut the traces that are coming from the microcontroller, which is in this can here, and then have the RGB signals injected right into those lines. The problem is you lose the on-screen displays 
which can be a bit of a pain because you can't adjust any of the other things on the set. Although with some toggle switches and things like that, you can do that. I did an RGB mod quite a long time ago on a trash picked TV I found on the side of the street. And that was the way I had to do that RGB mod. And while it worked, it was kind of a pain because you had to flip a bunch of switches just to see the on-screen displays, which made making adjustments and calibration of the set kind of difficult. I happen to know because I've already looked up the data sheet for this video processor IC that it actually has a second RGB input. And that's what we're gonna use. Let's take a look at the data sheet. So this is the Jungle IC on use on this Sony set and probably countless others. As you can see here, it's an IC having an NTSC Color TV Luminance Signal Processing, Chrominance Signal Processing, Sync Signal Processing, RGB Interface, Auto Cutoff, Deflection Compensation, blah, 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 all integrated into one chip. If we just keep looking through here, this has a nice block diagram and let's zoom in here. Digital RGB input, this is the one that's used by the on-screen displays. And there's that blanking signal I talked about, which kind of turns on that digital signal for the letters to appear. But if we scroll down a little bit further, here's analog RGB input, and we have an RGB switch right here, the YS signal. And if you notice the flow of the signals here, the digital RGB comes in and it goes into this thick black arrow here, and it comes in and it joins up down here. But the analog signal actually goes up here through this contrast control, a clamp, and then down to the RGB switch, which is controlled by that YS signal and also uh, another digital input. And then it gets mixed with the on-screen displays and then continues on down here. Back on the service manual for this particular set, if we keep scrolling down past the rest of this, it actually has full schematics, not just a block diagram. And this right here, IC301, this is the jungle IC. And if we follow these traces, it does go over to the microcontroller, which is, here it is right here. So there's the OSD output. Now what's cool about the schematic here versus the block diagram is it shows all the passive components and the values, even though they're kind of hard to read on this bad quality scan, but we can see that they're there. And when we zoom back in here, we can see there's the analog RGB inputs, pin 16, 17, and 18. And you notice these are all connected together and it goes through, I don't know, like a one or a 10K resistor here. It'll be a surface mount on the bottom because it says chip and it goes to ground. Also pin 15, which is the switched input, which is, was it? Here it is, YS. This is what drives the RGB switch. If we follow the trace, it goes through a zero ohm resistor there and it goes to, well, there's another resistor to ground, although it doesn't have a value. It just has a little, uh, number sign it looks like. And if we follow the trace, seems to go, it's a little hard to follow, so I'm just gonna keep my mouse hovering over it. it seems to go over here to this O channel blank. Now I'm not 100% sure why they would do it this way because honestly this OSD blanking signal, they could also use that to just blank the entire video signal as well because if you don't turn on the blanking signal for the OSD only where the letters are, you turn it on all the time, then you're just gonna get a black screen and you'd have the letters for the OSD still visible. But this seems to be another way to make that happen. Either way, let's head back over to the data sheet for the Jungle IC so we can take a look at what specs we need for these input signals so that we can start using it for our own purposes. And just a few pages down, here are the inputs we're concerned about. There's the YS input. Now this little circuit diagram here, by the way, is not what's outside the chip, but what's inside the chip. They're just kind of giving you an idea of like what values you might see if you check pins 14 and 15 with a multimeter or something like that. There are a couple diodes uh, to ground and five volts. Uh, we have a 3.5K resistor, and then we have a transistor, and it's pulled down to ground with 3.5K. And over here, you can see VIL. So that's the maximum voltage that this chip can accept for a low input signal, and it's saying 0.4. So basically, zero volts to 0.4, it's gonna consider low, and then the minimum voltage for a high signal is going to be one volt. So anything one volt and up, it's gonna think is a high signal. As far as the analog RGB inputs, there's that more complicated input circuitry. It does show that it has a five volt signal on the pin at all times. So I guess if you measure it uh, with a multimeter with nothing connected to it, you are gonna have it at five volts. But over here, it just says that it's an analog RGB input to be input via a capacitor. So that means you do need to have a capacitor on that pin between whatever you're connecting to it and this video processor IC but it does say the specified input level is 0.7 volts peak to peak without sync, which luckily is exactly what the standards are on things like the Commodore Amiga or the Apple IIGS for its RGB output. 
That is very normal. Things like the Commodore 1084 also use a 0.7 volt peak to peak. That means that we don't have to create any kind of special circuitry to change the voltages that are going into these pins. We can just take them as is from the computer and send them right into these signals with a capacitor, of course, and it should just work. I've looked at some other data sheets for other jungle ICs in the past, and sometimes they need different voltage ranges. Like it might be zero to 2.5 volts peak to peak. And if you just give it a zero to 0 0.7 volt peak to peak signal from a computer into one of those, the image is gonna be way too dark. Now, further down the data sheet, there's a bunch of information on how the chip actually operates, which is kind of an interesting read, but I'm not gonna read that now. But it does have a little section here on the RGB input. And let's just read it together here. The analog RGB input signals go into pins 16, 17, and 18, and they're fed through the contrast control and the clamp. We saw that on the block diagram. It goes on to say that the switching between the RGB signals and the composite video, which is going through the YC block, it's done by using an I squared C bus register and also a signal from the YS pin on 15. When we talked about that YS pin, right? That's that one that has that one volt for high and what 0.4 volts for low. Now it is a bit worrisome that it mentions the I squared T bus register. That means that it is actually possible through a command over the serial bus from the microcontroller to entirely disable the analog RGB input. My hope is that the YS pin for switching between analog RGB and the regular video processing is still enabled because we saw on the data sheet that it is actually connected through to the microcontroller because the microcontroller seems to use that signal for some type of blanking. Also, it goes on to mention that the YM pin, which is pin 14, I, didn't, I kind of breezed over it earlier, it seems to be able to allow for a mixing of the YC video, the composite video, and the RGB video, uh, the analog RGB, at some type of uh, minus six dB. So I guess it's like an overlay kind of thing. It looked like on the schematic for the set, it actually is still hooked up to the microcontroller, but I don't think it's used for anything. So we're just gonna leave that alone. If we keep scrolling through the data sheet, it actually goes on to list all the I2C's command registers for all the various features of this chip. So you can see all the various things the microcontroller has full control of with this processing IC. And luckily, a lot of this stuff is actually fully exposed inside the service menu on the set, which allows us to fiddle with these settings, you know, without having to hack the microcontroller or change the code on it or anything like that, since that's pretty much gonna be impossible since this is a custom Sony part. It's not like we know how any of that works. Here's the particular register though that I was talking about where you can use I squared C to control the analog RGB. So there are three possible settings here. Zero and zero instructs the processor IC to use the YS pin 14 to switch between the analog RGB or uh, the YC. And then one zero is always sets the RGB, external RGB. And then one, I guess it says selects the TV. I'm thinking what that means is it's the YC block or the composite video input. So we're gonna keep our fingers crossed here that this is actually set for zero zero, which just allows us to manually control the RGB input using pin 50. The final thing we're gonna look at is what looks like out of a sample setup for how this IC should be used in a set. So notice here, like here's the I squared C bus signals and it has a hundred ohm resistors, for instance, hooked up to it. I think this is kind of like what they're recommending at the minimum you have hooked up to each of these signals so that you ensure like safe operation of the IC. If we take a look here at the YS and the analog RGB inputs, it shows them all being connected with a 220 ohm resistor. And also it's a little hard to read, but it's a 10 microfarad capacitor with the positive facing towards the processor chip. The big reason for this 10 microfarad on the analog inputs is because that is gonna filter any DC voltage that might be on those pins. Now I do wanna mention when doing this type of mod properly, what we should be doing is designing up a circuit using transistors that buffer the input signal coming in from the external device before it gets to the video processor IC. That is mainly to help shift those levels if we did need to shift them, although we already saw that the levels don't need to be shifted because this is expecting 0.7 volts, but it's also a good protection because if something were to go wrong inside this IC, for instance, well, it could send 12 volts out of those pins, which could somehow end up inside your Amiga, or the computer could have a problem as well, and then that could send some kind of bad voltages into the processor chip here and kill it. So those buffers allow you to have a little bit of safety because there's just some transistors in between, and if something were to catastrophically go wrong, well, you can just replace those transistors and those passive components instead of having to try to replace entire ICs. 
In fact, if we take a look at the YC input, so this is the Luma Chroma inputs into the processor IC, notice all it has is what looks like a 22 microfarad capacitor on the Y input, and that's it. No kind of buffering or anything like that. But if we take a look on the service manual for the TV, there's the Y input, and there is a 10 microfarad cap right there, so they didn't even use the 22 that was recommended on the data sheet. But if we go to the video input on the back of the TV, so that's the place where there's most likely to be something accidentally plugged in that shouldn't be, there is all sorts of safety stuff on here, including two buffer transistors. There's a Zener diode, which I think is gonna clamp the input. So if something really bad were to happen, then it would actually um, short that to ground, which kind of protects everything. There's a 220 microfarad cap right there and just some general circuitry just to keep things very protected. So this is the kind of input protection you probably wanna generate on your RGB input just to make sure that everything was as safe as possible. But in the interest of simplicity, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna kinda do the bare minimum based on the recommendation of the data sheet um, for the, the jungle IC. Okay, so I think we have a good plan of attack for adding RGB to this set. We know the Jungle IC has those analog RGB inputs, and based on the schematics, all three of them are tied together, and then that's tied to ground. So we're gonna have to cut some traces on the bottom of the board to break that connection, because we're gonna have to feed directly into each of those. In addition, the YS pin, which is the signal that turns on the analog RGB, is currently powered by, or you know, controlled by the microcontroller, which is what's inside this can right here. So we're gonna have to cut that connection as well, so that we can directly control the switch. For switching between RGB input and regular video or normal operation of the set, we're gonna have to install a toggle switch that basically controls that YS pin on this chip. Since there's no way with software control or the remote control to turn off and on the RGB, we're gonna have to do it with a manual switch if we wanna retain all the normal functions of this television. As far as the sync signal that comes from the external RGB device, we can just feed that into the composite video jack, which is right here on the board, since we saw in the schematic that it is the composite video that just sort of goes directly into the horizontal and vertical sync inputs on the main jungle IC, and it does all the sync decoding. The reason why it's called composite video is because it has the luminance information, the chrominance or the color information, and it has all the sync information all combined into one signal. And it is the duty of the jungle IC here to do all that kind of separation and pull out the sync information it needs and pull out the luminance and the chrominance information it needs from that composite video signal. If all we're feeding in to the composite jack is a sync signal, well, it's not going to have a luminance or chrominance signal to look at, but that doesn't matter because we don't need that. We're going to be feeding in the analog RGB. All we need this chip to be able to look at is the horizontal and vertical sync information, and that's going to be there fed right into that jack. There is one issue we're gonna have to address about the sync signals though. The video in jack is designed to accept a one volt peak to peak video input signal and not a typical sync signal, which on like VGA or most analog RGB devices is five volts peak to peak. So we're gonna have to design a little bit of a circuit there with an adjustable potentiometer to bring that down to around one volt peak to peak. It doesn't need to be exact. It could probably be a bit less or a bit more or whatever, and it's gonna work fine. But I just feel bad shooting a five volt signal into a jack that's designed for one volt peak to peak. And then the final thing to consider when you're doing an RGB mod is how you're gonna get the RGB signals into the set. The Sony luckily has this large plate which is visible through the back of the case even when the back cover is removed. And there's luckily plenty of space on here so we can install jacks and whatever on here and the switch and stuff like that. And we don't have to worry about the wires being attached to the back cover. So every time you remove the back of the TV set, you gotta disconnect a bunch of wires. This is extra nice about Sony sets and they typically have this back cover while I've found that a lot of other brands of sets, especially cheap ones, don't even bother. They just have some holes in the set and the jacks and stuff just sort of poke through those holes. So there's no easy way to add RCA jacks or whatever you're gonna do for the RGB input on those without dealing with a bunch of stupid wires. So that is a really nice bonus on Sony sets. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a DB9 connector with the same pinout as the Commodore 1084. The DB9 input on the Commodore 1084 is pretty good because it's relatively standardized and it's pretty easy to find cables that are designed for use with the Commodore 1084. In fact, I designed a bunch of adapters myself to go from various computers like the Apple IIgs GS to the nine pin connector on the 1084. So if I add the same nine pin connector on this with the same pinout, that means that all my existing cables can just work. 
I know a lot of people, even in North America here, like to use a SCART connector on the back of their set, but that connector is physically a lot larger and it's not as common to find those cables here in North America, while Commodore 1084 cables are certainly more common because if you even have a Commodore Amiga with the original cable, well, that cable is actually gonna work on this if I just install a nine pin connector. And looking at the back panel here, there's actually quite a bit of space right above these RCA jacks. Looks like there was originally a provision for a video and audio output. So it wasn't just input and they didn't actually put the jacks there. So I figure a nine pin connector could go right there and a switch could go somewhere over here on this part of the panel. And there's plenty of room in here for the wires to run. And I'm thinking that the RF modulator here or the tuner, I mean, is a good spot to stick a little PCB that then can have little wires that head over to the jungle IC to connect everything up. Okay, so I think that's all the theory taken care of. Let me go design a little circuit, build it up and install it in the monitor. Okay, the modification is done. Currently the set is back together. I'll take it apart again so I can show you exactly how it looks. But the set obviously on the outside looks fine. But if we look at the back, here is where the magic is. Well, you might be noticing that the back panel here is white and the one I was just showing was black. Well, yes, through the magic of buying two, I actually modified a different board. Well, it wasn't really two. This is actually the PCB out of the broken Sony TV set from my second channel. I got rid of the rest of the parts, but I kept the PCB and the, the uh, deflection yoke. And it turns out that the PCB works perfectly. And uh, it's actually what is inside this set right now. The only thing I lost was the DC power input, which is just a blank plate on this one here, but I don't need that 12 volts anyways. And this one has the provision for a fixed power cord, which had been cut off of that set. So I went ahead and I just attached a new power cord to it, which is why it's zip tied on right here, because it doesn't actually have the right uh, grommet that sits there to prevent it from like pulling out. But as you can see here, I've gone ahead and I added the nine pin DB9 with the pinout of the Commodore 1084. And I have the toggle switch here to switch between RGB and normal operation. Because these connections are on this black panel here, there is nothing on the back cover, so I can remove the cover easily enough and I don't have to worry about any wires um, being in the way or having to disconnect things as I pull the back cover off. With the back cover removed to install the nine pin connector, I just used the Dremel and I slowly ate away at the back panel here so I could then attach this nine pin and it is actually bolted in. So it's uh, pretty firm, it's not moving there. It means if I plug a connector in there, it's not gonna bend anything or pull on anything. And of course I just drilled a little hole for the switch here. That was easy. I kind of struggled to get the hole the right shape and size and there's like a little bit of uh, plastic eaten away there above the connector. So if you have any tips for how to do this in a better way, I'd love to know that. Off the nine pin connector, you see all these wires here. These are actually ones I cut out of an old CRT. I can't remember where it came from, but they are coaxial shielded cables, meaning the conductor in the center actually has extra insulation and then a ground lead around it that way uh, to avoid any kind of interference. I did that because I was trying to minimize any kind of interference or static that might be picked up from uh, the deflection yoke signals and things like that. And to be honest, it works perfectly. The signal is rock solid with absolutely zero interference. Right here is a little PCB where I have the RGB signals going into with the resistors and the capacitors. And then I also have an adjustable potentiometer right there, which is the voltage divider that takes the nine volts that is from the main um, jungle IC there and brings it down to that one volts that we're gonna need to switch between the RGB and the regular operation of the set. So the toggle switch on the back of the set comes over and into this board. And then that allows me to set the voltage of that switching point so that that switch works perfectly. These gray wires right here are actually the RGB signals and the YS or that RGB switching signal that is soldered right here onto the jungle IC. I actually decided to do it on the top side versus on the bottom side because I think the case holds onto the PCB along the sides here. And I just wasn't sure if you could run a wire and I wanted to avoid running wires all the way around the front or the back of the uh, circuit board. So I did it on the top side. The yellow wire is a ground wire for video ground, because of course you need to hook ground up for your video signals to get through into the IC. And it's a little hard to see, but there's an additional gray wire that's over here that is picking up the nine volts that is the power supply, the VCC circuit for this IC. I could have picked it up off of think pin two, but I decided to pick it off this little, um, I don't know, there's a jumper link right there, which is easier to solder onto. And that is used for the voltage divider that creates that one volts to switch to the RGB signal. 
On the underside of the board, we have to make a couple modifications to inject our signals. First thing you have to do is remove R304, which disconnects the YS signal from the microcontroller. And then we have to make two cuts to disconnect the RGB lines from each other, and also remove the resistor, which connects one of the RGB lines to ground. And there's one more thing that I did install. It's gonna be really hard to see just because I don't feel like taking the monitor apart any further, but there's another adjustable potentiometer hot glued down there onto the side of the video input jack. And that is the voltage divider that takes the sync signal that is coming in through the DB9 connector, which is on this yellow wire right here. Is that even coming out across in the camera? Maybe it's blurry. I apologize if it is, but that's the sync signal that comes in off pin seven. And then that goes down to that voltage divider. And with that connected directly onto the um, composite input, I have it actually soldered on there. That allows me to set that sync signal to about one volt peak to peak which is what that composite video input is expecting for its signals. I know that there wasn't a great view of all the stuff that was in here, but I just wanted to show that it all fits in here pretty easily without any interference with the other stuff in the monitor. Now let's go take a look at the schematic to see exactly what I did. Alrighty, here is the KiCad schematic that I came up with, and I actually did all this work ahead of time, just sort of off the cuff, and then I created the schematics once I had a working diagram. So let's go through what I came up with. All right, so here's the DB9. There's the RGB signals that come off of it, and they just go into the 220 ohm resistors and the 10 microfarad caps as outlined in the data sheet from Sony. Now, I ended up using ceramic caps. They were bipolar, 10 microfarad, I think 25 volts or so. Ideally, I should have used like 50 volt caps. That seems like what most TV sets have on those protection circuits. And if you do want to use a polarized circuit, as it was actually mentioned in the data sheet, as long as you put the positive side towards the IC or the jungle IC, which is right here, IC301, then you should be fine. You don't have to use uh, ceramic bipolars. It just happened to be what I had. Next up is the ground signal or the video ground, and that is actually coming from the DB9 connector on point on pins one and two. And I'm going through those coax shielded cables. I have all those shields kind of combined together and then soldered onto pin one and two. And that makes its way over to my little handmade PCB. And then that ends up going to pin 13 video ground on the jungle IC. Next up is the sync signal, which is pin seven, and I have it labeled C sync. And we follow it down here, just ignore this stuff for a second. I will talk about that in a moment. So that sync signal goes into an adjustable potentiometer here. Uh, it's a 10 turn, I, I don't remember the value, it's just something I just had, I just stuck it in. It goes up to ground on the other side, and then the output, which is the middle, pin two, goes through a diode, which I'll talk about why I did that in a second. But that is the new sync signal, and that makes its way to the center pin on the RCA jack. I just soldered it onto the inside of the set. Now this adjustable potentiometer, as I mentioned, is to adjust the sync level to bring it down to one volt peak to peak. So the way I adjusted that to get it kind of based Baseline is I fed a sync signal from the Amiga into this system, but I didn't have it connected to the RCA jack yet. I didn't have this diode in place. So then I adjusted the potentiometer to get one volt peak to peak on my oscilloscope. Then I connected it up to the RCA jack, which did present some load because the RCA jack has all that protection circuitry and it's terminated. So it presents a load to that signal. It brought it down to like 500 millivolts peak to peak. So I adjusted the pot to bring it back up to one volt and we're all good. The reason why I put the diode in place is because when you're using this set with normal composite video input, what's gonna happen is this is actually gonna present a path to ground, so here's ground up here, for the video signal, which will make it darker than it should be. It all depends on the uh, resistance value of how you have this pot adjusted to like how much effect that's going to have, but it will potentially have some effect. So I put a diode in place. I just grabbed a random diode I had on my desk, stuck it in there. And as long as the band is facing towards the RCA jack, that means that any video signal that's present on the jack itself is not gonna make its way back through this part of the circuit and find its way to ground. And it seemed to have no ill effects on the sync signal that's making its way into the RCA jack when I put the uh, a diode in place. It works either way. Next up, let's look at the circuit I designed for switching between RGB and normal. So there's the switch, which is on the back of the set. One side of it goes through a 220 ohm resistor to ground, and that was what was outlined in the data sheet that for the Sony Jungle IC. It said to do it through a 220 ohm resistor. That's probably a protection thing in case something goes catastrophically wrong inside the IC. You don't just have a direct short to ground on that pin. You have a little bit of current limiting. The other side of that switch goes through an adjustable potentiometer, and this is to generate that one volt that the data sheet said we need to give that pin to switch between the two modes. So one side of that variable resistor goes to ground, and the other side makes its way all the way up here to the nine volts that is on pin two that actually is the power supply for the jungle IC. 
So what I did is with no load on the output of this resistor, I just checked pin two and adjusted it until I got around one volt. And then I connected it to the input pin, which is uh, pin 15 there, YS input. And it brought it down a little bit and I just adjusted it for one volt. But I did find by the way, that anything between like 0.5 volts and one volt results in RGB image. And I think like 0.4 volts or less or something like that results in uh, just the composite video. So yes, as it was not mentioned in the data sheet, it is one volt that gives you analog RGB and it is ground or no signal really that results in normal operation or just composite video of uh, the jungle I see. And the final thing I wanna talk about is what's going on with these two resistors, horizontal and vertical sync. So pins eight and nine on the Commodore 1084 on certain Commodore 1084s allows it to take a horizontal and vertical sync, not just a composite sync, which is on pin seven. Certain machines like the Atari ST don't have a composite sync signal. All they do is output horizontal and vertical sync. And I wanted to be able to use that with this particular TV. Now, when we look down here, all I'm doing is simply taking two 470 ohm resistors, combining it together to create the composite sync. Now I hear people typing right now that, oh, that's not the correct way to create a composite sync signal. And that is absolutely true. It is not. But, but I will say, that while I was looking at the schematic for the Commodore 1084 from Philips, the one I showed earlier in the video, it has a horizontal and vertical sync pin on both of its RGB input pins or connectors, and it combines them together to create a composite sync internally using two 470 ohm resistors. And combining it with these two resistors just seems to work. So I thought, well, I'll just replicate that on my little board here and see what happens. And sure enough, with the Atari ST, works perfectly. This set has no problem decoding the sync when it's combined this way, even though it's not the correct way to do it, it does work. Now the sync signals that come out of the Atari ST are five volt syncs, as is the composite sync out of the Amiga, but going through these two resistors and then going through the variable potentiometer here results in a combined sync signal about 600 millivolts. But as I said before, the input on this monitor is very tolerant and it seems to not mind at all that you have a lower sync signal. So that does work but it is totally optional. You don't have to put that there if you don't want to. And for me, it only allowed me to have a little bit more flexibility to be able to use both composite sync devices and horizontal and vertical sync devices. And I was very pleasantly surprised to find that it worked. So there we go. That is my circuit. That's how I did the mod on this set. So let's take a look at it actually in operation. To show off the capabilities of the set, I'm gonna use it with my Amiga 600 here, which is a perfect combo. And I'm just gonna use the original Commodore Amiga 1084 cable here to show that that nine pin connector on the back is bog standard and means we don't have to make any custom cables whatsoever. I just have to plug this connector into the back of the set and that's all it will take. And let's just turn it on. Luckily, all is working well. Now with the set powered up, I obviously don't have anything hooked up but we're on the tuner and you can just see the static. The switch on the back is set for normal operation. So the composite video input will work as normally, although I don't recommend connecting an RGB source and a uh, composite video at the same time, because remember, we're using that composite video input for the sync from the computer. But if I switch the switch on the back here, then the tuner goes away, which yes, that's the way it's gonna work. It's basically gonna turn on the RGB for all, well, all the time basically. So no matter what input we're using, whether it's tuner or composite, we're gonna see black right now because the computer is currently off. But we do wanna hit TV video so that we are on the composite video input because that's where the sync signal is coming from. And now if we turn on the Amiga, if I find the switch, there it is. Notice the video went away and that's because the image is currently synced up correctly. And after a few seconds, the Amiga takes a little bit of time to boot and it normally is a black screen like that. It will, we'll see the workbench. So there it is. Sorry about the bar that's moving up the image. That is the camera scan rate, not mixing exactly with the Amiga. And there we have it. Amiga workbench with pretty good clarity on this little Sony TV. Now, let me just load a picture here. We can see how nice it looks. There it is, all 4,096 colors, ham mode on this little set. And it absolutely looks freaking phenomenal. Now you have to take my word for it that it looks really good. And that's because putting my camera towards a CRT never results in a very good image. It just doesn't look good. And if I put it up close, it's just gonna have a moray pattern. It's gonna look terrible, but it looks really, really quite good. It's quite readable. Even though this particular CRT on this nine inch set is not the most high resolution. And by resolution, I mean the dot pitch. And I always get this wrong, but the dot pitch 
is higher on this set, like I don't know what number it would be, like say it's 0 0.40, which I think is the amount of space between the little RGB stripes on the set, the lower that number is or the closer to zero it is, the higher resolution the CRT can resolve. And this one is designed just for regular consumer television use. So it is not that high res. And while the text on here is completely readable, it's still not the best. But for playing games and stuff, it's gonna work absolutely perfectly. I'm rebooting the computer with the Amiga test kit disc in here. There it is. So we can just take a look at the video test. So there is that nice RGB signal and it's looking pretty darn good. Now, the reason why I brought up this test pattern is it allows you to do some amount of adjustment to try to get the proper range of video signals. I'm noticing here that a bunch of these bars are just missing altogether, like I don't see them. And that's because the black level on this set is set too low, the black level being the brightness. Now, as I mentioned, the on-screen displays are working perfectly in here. So if we go under here and we go to brightness, I can turn up the brightness and hopefully it's gonna start to make some of these visible and it is. Now I'm able to start to see those bars. Now, if I turn this up too high, the black itself starts to become gray and you don't want that. You wanna turn it down so the black is actually black, but you're still able to resolve uh, those colors up at the top. And I'm gonna say that this is a good spot. Now, one of the problems is, of course, is that if we put a composite video signal into this TV now, that setting is gonna be too high. And that's just unfortunately one of the side effects of RGB into these sets because it only has one set of picture controls, which are these controls right here that apply to all of the video inputs at the same time. If we had a complicated buffer circuit on the input of the RGB, that would allow us to fine tune it to try to match it perfectly to uh, the other video signals on the set. But the problem is actually, is that I found that the RGB output that comes from different computers varies a little bit. And the Amiga's output seems to be a little bit dimmer than say an Apple IIgs. And the Atari ST has a really hot output, meaning the RGB output puts out a lot more voltage than these other computers and the image is way too bright. So your mileage may vary and that's just one of the unfortunate side effects. You're gonna have to go and fiddle with these settings um, depending on what RGB source you're using for the best possible image. Now, incidentally, it says color and hue on here, but if we go to color and we turn that down, that has no effect. Notice it's still a color image, and that's because, of course, we're bypassing the entire composite input block, and we're just inputting the uh, RGB directly into that video processor chip. Now, here we are back in Workbench, and I have the screen mode control open. I'm gonna switch this over to PAL, PAL high res, and hit save. And notice it is rolling. We still have a color image, but it is rolling. And that's because by default out of the box, these Sony TVs in North American market only support 60 Hertz mode and don't support 50 Hertz natively. Luckily, there's a setting in the service mode that we can turn on to allow this set to work in both PAL and NTSC RGB modes. To get to the service mode on a Sony set, you just turn it off and you use a remote. I'm using this uh, universal remote here, but you hit display five volume up and you push the power button and the set is gonna be in the service mode. So since it was rolling, I just shut off the computer, which means it's a little easier to see the screen. So there are two relevant settings in the service menu, which you really need to adjust while you're using an RGB mode. To go through the settings, you push one and four to scroll through the options. The first setting we want to change to allow the TV to work at a wider range of vertical frequencies all the way down to I think like 49 hertz or so is VSMO. It's always set to zero by default, which keeps the TV only working around 60 hertz. But if we push the three button, that changes the option to one. The only two options there are is one and zero, and that allows the TV to work at a wider range. Notice it has actually squished the on-screen display a little bit, and you notice it's flickering a little bit more in the camera. That's because while there's no sync signal because the computer's turned off, it's actually free running and it's running closer to 50 Hertz now on its own. So I've turned on the computer, it's gonna look fine. It's still set to one here, um, but the machine is by default running in NTSC because that's how this computer is configured. So this will boot up into workbench and then it should switch into PAL mode. And now with that setting set, it is not rolling. Let me just fix the shutter rate on the camera. There we go, I have the camera locked at 50 Hertz now. I can see it's a little, there's a little bit of a line there, but at least it's not flickering so bad. I see a visible flicker in the image, of course, because, well, it's running at 50 Hertz and 
50 hertz flickers a little bit more than 60 hertz. But otherwise, it is looking completely good. No more rolling image. So this VSMO setting is absolutely necessary if you want to use your monitor at 50 hertz. Incidentally, if you put a PAL video signal into the set now with it set to 1, the image will be black and white, but it won't roll. Still is unable to decode a PAL color system. This set only supports NTSC, and that is it. There are actually two other relevant settings for this set that I want to mention, and one of them is H pause or H position. This adjusts the image horizontally side to side. One caveat on the RGB input on these Sony sets is that compared to the composite input, the entire image is actually shifted a little bit over to the left. You'd be able to see this if I unplug the RGB cable and I plug the composite signal into the back, flip the little RGB switch, we'd see the image would be shifted over probably, well, like, I don't know, half the width of my finger. Now, the bigger the screen, the more the shift is. I think the default setting I had on this set was more like eight or so, and the RGB image was just over to the side a little bit. Now, this setting only goes up to 15. That's as much as you can move it over there. There's not a huge range of adjustability. It goes from zero to 15. But the, the original setting was lower than I have it here to keep the image nicely centered. 11 seems to be a good spot. This particular set has an H size control for adjusting the width, but this control actually doesn't do anything on this particular set. This is just left over from the firmware, which is probably the same as on larger ones. And there is just no circuitry in the set to allow the microcontroller or the video processor IC to adjust the width. It's actually mentioned in the service manual that that setting has no effect. And there are a few other settings around pin cushion and things like that that also have no effect on this smaller set. But if this setting did work, it means we could probably shake the image a little bit horizontally to allow it to you know, be a little less sensitive to the positional error of the RGB mode, but it doesn't, so there's nothing we can do. The vertical position and the vertical size controls do work perfectly on this set, so you can still use those to try to adjust those settings. The other relevant setting is this one, RGBP. And this is the RGB or the analog RGB picture control level. Now on Sony sets, picture control is the contrast control on other sets. It's essentially the white level. The brightness control is the black level adjustment and the picture control is the white level control. If you have that set too high, the overall image is too bright. And you don't wanna do that because the brighter it is, the more quickly it's gonna wear out your CRT and it's gonna overdrive it and make it a little blurry, stuff like that. So you wanna make sure that you keep those picture controls set at a reasonable level. This set is in really, really good shape and watching normal composite video, the picture control set in the middle results in a really bright, vibrant image that isn't overdriving the CRT and it's not blooming. And the same goes for this setting here. This is the only way you can adjust the overall brightness on the analog video input. Now you notice I've turned down to zero and the image is darker and obviously the higher it goes, the brighter it gets. It does go all the way up to I think 31 and that results in a very, very bright image and the setting of around 11 or 12 is a good compromise. It results in a very bright, nice image without overdriving anything. Now, if you're in here fooling around with a service mode and you make a mistake or you do something you shouldn't do, just turn the set off and on and it will reset all the settings to whatever they were before. But if you have everything dialed in where you want it, like I do here and I wanna save it, then you push the mute button, which says right, right here, but doesn't save it yet. You gotta push the enter button and that changes it to red. And now those settings are saved. To exit out of the service menu, you turn the TV off, either from the remote or from the TV's front. And now it will actually be saved in all those settings. There it is, we're still running in 50 Hertz mode. And let's switch back to 60 Hertz so I can stop looking at this flicker here. And there we go, NTSC high res. And there it is, I set the camera back to 60 Hertz. And there we are, a nice stable 60 Hertz image that looks amazing. So I did some testing with this TV, hooking up to various things, and obviously with the Amiga, works really well. Also works really well with the Apple II GS. The image is a little bit too bright with the Apple II GS, and by bright, I mean the black level is a bit too much, so you have to turn the brightness control down in the menu. The blacks look a little bit gray. Very quick and easy setting to fix, so that makes that look good. And then I hooked the Atari ST up to this thing, and that worked as well. Although, like I mentioned earlier, that the Atari ST outputs a really, really hot signal and it's really, really too bright. I had to set the picture control in the service menu all the way to zero and it still seemed a bit too bright. 
So I think the right thing to do on the Atari ST would be to add some resistors to the cable that I made myself that goes to the nine pin connector that's on the back of this set or a 1084. And that would bring the levels down to a more acceptable level. When I hook the Atari ST up to like a 1084, I just turn the brightness and the contrast way down to make it look good. But that's a little harder to do on this set having to go into that service menu. But from a centering perspective, the Amiga, the Atari ST, and the 2GS all look perfectly centered with a very acceptable border around them. And they all otherwise output a really sharp, clear image. And there are no problems with sync, no weird rolling problems or anything else with the picture, no distortion issues. It just works perfectly. So there we have it. That is my RGB mod for this little Sony nine inch set. It works better than I ever would have imagined. I'm super excited to be able to just easily carry this set around when I'm going to meets or friends' houses or whatever and plug RGB things right into the back and have it just freaking work. I'll stick some pictures of the mod and my KiCad file up on my GitHub. I'll put a link in the description below if you wanna take a look at those yourself. I have a feeling that mod will work pretty easily on other Sony sets of a similar vintage because I think all the same chips are gonna be in them no matter what the size is. And you should be able to do this same mod on those other sets and have it just work. If you're an electrical engineer and you'd like to improve on my crappy design, please feel free. Some real buffering would be really nice, not to mention an actual PCB that people could have made and then just populate to do this mod without having to do a bunch of hand soldering like I did. So that's gonna be it. If you liked this video, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They get early access to videos, behind the scenes stuff, live streams, things like that. And if you wanna become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description below. Comment down below with your thoughts. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Bell icon, you know, all the usual YouTube stuff. So yeah, that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.